you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke. If you don't have a Bible this morning, I encourage you to grab one out of the back real quick. We are going to uh, um, we're going to be um, reading a bit more scripture this morning than we sometimes do. Uh, we're at Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. This morning, I'd like to see what the Bible says about a couple about a couple characters. Involved in the Christmas account. Luke chapter 1 and we're going to begin in verse 1. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first. To write to you in an orderly sequence most honorable Theophilus. So that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Lord, as we study your word this morning, please uh, make it real and alive to us. Please use it to uh, cut off what needs to be cut, to trim, to uh, shape what needs to be shaped in our lives. I uh, ask you to give me the words to say. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to do a work here today. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. As we begin our study uh, heading toward Christmas, I want you to notice first who God chose to give us the greatest record of the birth of His Son. The Gospel of Luke and the record of Acts were both written by Luke. According to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, Luke was trained as a medical doctor. He was not trained as a preacher. He was not even an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, but he was a companion of Paul and is often referred to as Luke the Evangelist. Even though he was not an eyewitness to the events of Jesus' life like Matthew, Mark, and John were, God used him to write more of the New Testament than anyone else. Because of his careful study and because of his concern and passion for telling other people about Jesus Christ. God inspired Luke to write over 27% of the New Testament. He tells us facts about the birth of Jesus that none of the other gospel writers do. He includes parables of Jesus that none of the other writers share. And Luke alone. We find the parable of the Good Samaritan, the publican and the Pharisee who went to the temple to pray, the rich man and Lazarus, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the unjust steward, the rich fool, and the story of Zacchaeus. My point, God can use you to tell his story even if you've never planned or wanted to be a preacher. All of us have been called to be evangelists, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you go, you are called to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. You are called to be students of Scripture and then called to share with others what you have seen and heard and experienced in your own lives. Gary was telling me this week about a camper on mission they had hoped would be able to join them here for Christmas in the country to do evangelism work here in the pavilion with them. But he's having some medical issues, so he was unable to come. But the other day, while he was at the doctor's office, he led his doctor to the Lord. Turn to somebody near you and tell them, God has called you to tell people about him. God has called you to tell people about him. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. And that assignment was not just given to Matthew, Mark, and John. It was not just given to the first 11 disciples, but it was given to every born again, baptized follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has entrusted to each one of you the responsibility to tell other people the good news, the great news that God loved them enough to send his son, Jesus Christ, to pay a price so that they would not. And it is your responsibility and mine to faithfully share the good news of Jesus Christ. What an honor. What a privilege to be a representative of Jesus Christ. 
for God used an ordinary man to tell us a miraculous account of his son. Now look with me again there, if you will, please, in verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. When his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. How can I know this, Zechariah asked the angel, for I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I will send to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. She said, The Lord has done this for me. He has looked with, looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. And drop down, if you will, please, to verse 39. In those days, Mary sat down and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill what he has spoken to her. In this passage of scripture, we are introduced to two people, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth were minding their same self-owned business. They weren't trying to be famous. They had no idea they would be recorded in the Bible. They were simple people minding their own business. But notice what the Bible tells us about this couple. Number one, they were righteous. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 6. Both were righteous in God's sight. The Bible tells us that Zachari Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were righteous people. And then it goes on in verse 6 to, six to define for us what that word means. It means living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. In other words, they did what they knew was right. You see, the problem in most of our churches today and often in our country as well is not that we do not know the will of God. And it is not so much that we do not know the word of God, but it is that we do not do the will of God. We do not do what we already know to do. It amazes me the number of people who are looking for some secret knowledge or secret twist to the Bible that will make their walk or their experience with the Lord better. You know the greatest key to walking with the Lord and being filled with the Holy Spirit? The greatest key is to do what you already know to do. They were living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. There is no magic key. There is no secret handshake you have to unlock. Do what you already know to do. I grew up in the church. 
I've been a Christian since I was six years old. For much of my early years, I did church on Sunday and lived like the world during the rest of the week. But I remember when I went away to college and had to make a conscious decision on whether or not to attend church. I thank the Lord that he introduced me to a good church and a good pastor where I began to grow. But I remember in that process that I took a, took a look and took time and looked back on the congregation of the church I attended growing up. And I talked to the Lord about it. I said, Lord, there are some people in this church that seem to have something I don't. You've met one of them, Mrs. Crippen, my Sunday school teacher from second and third grade who visited here. I said, Lord, there are some people in the church that seem to have a joy others don't have. There are some people who seem to have a peace that I don't have. Lord, I don't want to play around anymore. Lord, I, I, I don't know what it is that's different about them, but I want what they have. And you know what that is? Some people refer to it as the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In other words, these people have made the conscious decision to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. They have made a conscious decision to live out what they already know to do. They made a decision that they don't want to play church anymore. They don't want to try and walk with the Lord part of the time and walk in the world the rest of the time. They decided they were throwing in the whole kit and caboodle. It's Jesus or nothing for them. We're asked so many times in the Bible to choose one or the other and to quit playing games. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua has led the people into the promised land, the land where the Jewish people still reside today. He led the people into the promised land, and as he did, he told the people, beginning in verse 14, Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt, and worship the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today which you will worship. The gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates. Freighty's river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. Joshua says, my family and I, we have made our decision. We're not going to play games anymore. We're not going to be wishy-washy. We're not going to be kind to church folks and kind to not. As for me and my house. As far as I have anything to say about it, as far as I can do anything about it, we are going to serve the Lord. And do you know that if a child is the first person in a household to become a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability that everyone else in the house will become a Christian. If the mother is the first to become a Christian, there's a 17% probability everyone else in the household will become a Christian. But if the father is the first, to become a follower of Jesus Christ, there is a 93% probability everyone else in the house will follow Christ as well. Ladies, I in no way want to downplay your impact or your importance. Heaven knows most churches would shut down and close the doors if it was not for you and what you do. And we remember that Timothy became a Christian because of the teachings of his mother and grandmother when his dad was an unbeliever. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul writes, I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am convinced is in you also. Paul says to Timothy, man, I'm glad you had a godly mother and a godly grandmother because your dad had nothing to play, no part to play in you following the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad for the impact they had. Ladies, I will never downplay the, your importance or your impact, but men, listen to me. Are you listening? You have a responsibility to set the spiritual tone in your home. If your wife walks closer to the Lord than you do, then you are a fortunate and blessed man, but you should also be embarrassed because you are called to be the spiritual leader of your home. Make a decision and quit playing games. Well, Gene, my wife is a better reader than I am. She can read the Bible more easily than I can. Then dad burn it, get a translation you can read and understand for crying out loud and quit making excuses. Not all of them are great, but all of them are better than nothing. Man, I, I knew a guy in Arkansas got saved reading the living Bible for crying out loud. 
When I pastored in Mississippi, one of the deacons in that church only had a fourth grade education and couldn't read worth spit. But when he got saved, he had his wife and his sons teach him to read because he wanted to know the Bible for himself. And I can tell you, he was the spiritual leader of his house. You make a decision. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we are told, So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Elijah asked the folks to make a decision. Quit playing footsie with the Lord and get real. Save your places and turn with me, if you will, please, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. There Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed. And the destruction of that house was great. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? Practicing the Lordship of Jesus means you make Him the Lord of your life and you do what you already know to do. Zach Zachariah and Elizabeth were righteous. But I want you to know, my friends, they were also disappointed. Look there again, if you will, please, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 7. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive. And both of them were well alone. In years. The Bible tells us they were righteous. But they were also disappointed. For verse 7 tells us they had no children. Many of us know people who have struggled to have children. But who have been unable to do so. For many folks that can be heartbreaking and very disappointing. And while that's true in our day it was even more in those days. A son was needed to carry on the family name and to carry on the lineage. In those days, folks often looked down on adults if they were unable to have children. Some even considered them cursed by God. Kind of makes it difficult to serve as a priest if people consider you cursed. And so they were disappointed. Let me tell you, there are few people who get through life without being disappointed. You don't always end up with the job you want or the promotion you work for. Interest rates go up so you're unable to afford the house you would hope for. If you'll look at the end of both ends of Garfield Road, you'll see there's a sign that says, For Sale, Five Acres. That property is on Old Titusville Road right across the street from the church's driveway. The, it's owned by the son of a guy I grew up with. A guy I went to college with. A guy who spent many days out here playing volleyball and swimming with us in the lake and fishing out there on the lake. His son bought that property on old Titusville Road hoping to build a house on it. But one thing after another has happened and so now they are living with their in-laws waiting for the housing market to change so they can get a house. Disappointment. You do your best to rear your children in a God-fearing home, setting an example for them, and they end up living in or like the world, completely rejecting your God and your values. Disappointment. In spite of all of their disappointments, though, they were faithful. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division, division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Drop down to verse 8. When his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. At the hour 
of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right hand of the altar of incense. Zechariah was a priest. He did what he was supposed to do when he was supposed to. He wasn't looking to jump ahead and to become the high priest. He wasn't pulling strings and working the politics to get himself in favor or to get himself a promotion or anything. He kept doing what he was called by God to do when he was supposed to do it. It says that he was chosen by lot to go in and burn incense. Because some parts of the sacred service were more honorable than others, both the priests and Levites divided the whole among them by lot. We are told that there were three priests employed about the service of the incense. One who carried away the ashes left on the altar at the preceding service. Another one who brought a pan of burning coal from the altar of sacrifice and having placed it on the golden altar departed. A third who went in with the incense, sprinkled it on the burning coals, and while the smoke ascended made intercession for the people. This was the part that fell to Zacharias and the most honorable in the whole service. Zechariah and Elizabeth did what they were supposed to do when they were supposed to do it, and they trusted the outcome to God. It amazes me the num what God does when people are where they are supposed to be doing what they are supposed to be doing. It amazes me how God works through ordinary people doing ordinary things when they are faithful and continue to do what's right even when they have been disappointed. They were faithful. But I want you to know, my friends, this godly couple was also excited. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 39. In those days, Mary sat down and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. Elizabeth got pregnant. Mary came to visit her. Both of them are expectant mothers. And Elizabeth was excited. Excited to be a mother, yes, but even more excited to be part of God's plan. Gladys and I married late, so we are older parents. And because of Gladys' prematurely graying hair, we were sometimes confused as Drew's grandparents. I remember when Gladys went to the maternity shop for the first time to buy her first maternity clothes. A little girl behind the counter asked Gladys if she was buying those clothes for her daughter. And Gladys said, no, they're for me. The little girl spit and sputtered and didn't know what to say. She said, uh, uh, I, I was just asking because you're not showing. Uh, here's a hint for you. When you stick one foot in your mouth, shut up. There's no need to put the second one in there too. And there are certain things that come with being an older parent. Elizabeth was excited about finally becoming a parent. But when Mary came to visit, Elizabeth didn't go on and on about them both being parents. She talked about the baby jumping in her womb when she heard Mary's approach. She was excited about being part of God's plan and part of God's work. She didn't look down on Mary's youth. She didn't trumpet her own pregnancy and her old age. She talked about the Savior's mother coming to visit her. She was excited to play the part God had given her in his unfolding work, in his unfolding plan. Lord, give us more people who are excited about playing the part, playing the role the Lord has given us in your unfolding plan. I don't have to be the soloist where everyone can see me, but Lord, let me prayerfully worship you. I don't have to serve communion so everyone can see how important I am in the church, but Lord, let me split the wood for the burn fires. 
bonfires. Let me serve in the kitchen. Let me pull a trailer or build a shelf or fluff a tree or string some lights. Lord, it's not about me. It's about you. And I'm excited about being part of what you are doing. Lord, thank you for letting me part, be part of your family and part of your team serving in your kingdom. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. What an honor, what a privilege to be called co-laborers with God. Zechariah and Elizabeth were excited to be part of the work that God was doing. They didn't care about their place. They were unconcerned about others' opinions. They were excited to be part of what God was doing. Isn't it great being part of the winning team? Isn't it great to know that God trusts you enough to use you as well? Isn't it an honor to be known as an ambassador of Jesus Christ? They were excited about being used by God and seeing God work. But I want you to know that they were also obedient. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 56. Uh, verse 57, I'm sorry. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she had a son. Then her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her his great mercy, and they rejoiced with her. And when they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother responded, No, he will be called John. Then they said to her, None of your relatives has that name. So they motioned to his father to find out what he wanted him to be called. He asked for a writing ta tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they were all amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came on all those who lived around them and all these things were being talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard about him took it to heart saying, What then will this child become? For indeed the Lord's hand was with him. In verse 13, the angel told Zechariah to name his son John. And now when the son was born, he had the opportunity to give him a name that would carry on the family lineage. He had the opportunity to give him a name that would honor his dad, but no. The Lord said, name him John, and they did. They were obedient. And then did you see what it says in verse 65? Fear came on all those who lived around them. And all these things were being talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. I wonder, I wonder if perhaps we Christians walked more closely to the Lord. If we walked more obediently to the Lord. If we did what we knew to do. If perhaps the fear of God might fall on our neighbors as well. If the fear of God might fall on our nation as well, if perhaps revival might come to our nation as well, if the people of God did the will of God according to the timing of God when God wanted them to do it, I wonder if perhaps the fear and the Holy Spirit of God might fall on our nation once again. If we, the people of God, began asking what is God's will instead of what can I get away with, what will God wink at, how far can I push the limit instead of how much I can be like Jesus Christ? I wonder if perhaps the fear of the Lord might fall on our nation once again. They were obedient, but they were also expectant. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 76. 
And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us, to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The angel told Zechariah that his son was going to prepare the way for the arrival of the Messiah. And poor old Zechariah didn't have any more sense than to believe what he was told. Well, my friends, the Lord has given us an assignment as well. He has given you and I a job as well. We have been told to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. You and I have been called to be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have the honor of announcing his first arrival, but we have the honor and opportunity to be filled by the Holy Spirit and used by God to announce to a lost and dying world that Jesus is coming again. Zechariah and Elizabeth, ordinary people living obedient lives and used by God to change the world. And my friend, there is no, no there is Nothing you can do that will impact your life greater or have a greater impact for the kingdom of God than to do what you already know to do. This morning, Gladys shared with you about the lady who Ron got to lead to the Lord in the prayer tent Friday night. The lady was witnessed to by some folks at the fair. Because of their witness, because of the seeds they sowed into her life, she followed up with Ron and came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And you and I are given a promise as well. In Psalm 126, beginning in verse 5, we are told those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. The one goes along weeping, carrying the bag of seed. He will surely come back with shouts of joy, carrying his sheaves. My friends, go and be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we cry and we lament over the state of our nation and over the things that we see going on here. Father, I wonder how much of what we see going on is because we are not doing what we already know to do. I pray that you will help us to be obedient followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we will be excited about being part of the work that you are doing. That we will strive to represent you well, not looking for compromises, but looking for ways that we can serve and please you. God, please send revival to our nation and let it begin here. In the precious and holy name that is above every name, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.